got another group heading in this direction, probably about seven or eight. Would we be better if we had 50 or 100 Facebooks all violating consumers' privacy? Now I have to like Photoshop it a little bit to give it that kind of Photoshop look. Alabama's governor signed the strictest abortion bill in the country into law. A day after 25 Republicans, all white men, passed it in the state Senate. The measure bans abortions, even in cases of rape or incest, punishes doctors who perform the procedure with up to 99 years in prison, and only allows an exception for women whose health is at serious risk. The U.S. State Department has ordered non-essential personnel out of the American embassy in Baghdad and the consulate in Erbil. The administration is convinced an attack by Iranian-backed forces on American interests is imminent. Either that, or it wants to start a fight. Last week, the Pentagon hurried an aircraft carrier group into the Persian Gulf, ostensibly to keep Iran from trying anything. But the British general overseeing allied forces in the area doesn't share America's concern. No, there's been no uh, increased threat um, from uh, Iranian-backed forces in Iraq and Syria. As many as 600 TSA employees could be heading to another busy travel hub this summer, the Mexican border. The TSA says they're recruiting volunteers to help their parent agency, the Department of Homeland Security, in support roles that won't involve immigration duties. The Flight Attendants Union says the move will undermine security at the, quote, exact wrong time. The U.S. Embassy in Austria has managed to crowbar its consular services into a place Americans associate with safety and convenience. Starting today, every McDonald's in the country will also serve a 24-hour hotline for Americans to contact the embassy, though the chain clarifies that its 194 locations will still be Austrian territory. When migrants arrive at the border to request asylum, they have two ways to enter the U.S. 83-48. The first is to go through an official border crossing. But the U.S., in a policy called metering, allows in only a few people each day. Thousands are left waiting. The people you see here went with the second option. They're crossing between ports of entry, a misdemeanor under American law. More and more migrants are taking this path. Last month, the number found crossing illegally almost hit 100,000, the highest in 12 years. A large majority, more than ever before, are families. The first people they encounter in the U.S. are agents of the Border Patrol, who took us on a ride along on the line between Ciudad Juarez and El Paso. Right, control mic 23. Go ahead. We got another group heading in this direction, probably about seven or eight. In the two hours before sunset, more than 100 people stepped over the Rio Grande. Unlike past generations of immigrants, these families aren't trying to slip past the border patrol. They simply walk over and turn themselves in the first step to claiming asylum for anyone who enters illegally. ¿De dónde vienen ustedes? De Honduras. Tienen documentos para estar en los Estados Unidos legalmente. Okay. Tengan paciencia, ahorita los van a atender. That baby's pretty sick. Okay. He's got all the meds and stuff, but he looks like shit. Okay. ¿Por qué decidiste cruzar por acá y no por el puente? La verdad, pues me preocupa mi niño también. Sí. Pero en algún momento pensaste cruzar <coughs> por, el, por el puente oficial. Ah, pues sí, era la idea, pero no pude. No me... ¿Por qué no pudiste? La verdad, mi niño no puede esperar, viene bien mal. ¿Alguien aparte del niño está lastimado? ¿Está enfermo? ¿No? Ok. Cuando lo llevemos a la estación, allá pueden ver el médico. Ok. Go ahead, you want four? Rough call, the group is 15. Control, if I can do it. Entry. ¿Quieres una tú también? Una. ¿Te ponemos una? Sí. 
Pásenla ya con lo oficial. One of the migrants back there that I spoke to said that his original plan was to wait to cross over the bridge legally, but he couldn't wait anymore because his child was sick. Do you think that the fact that people are having to wait so long to cross legally is is pushing them to cross this way illegally, the way we're seeing them cross right now? No. Why not? No, I mean, the capacity is the same thing. Even if we'd allow everybody to come in, even at the ports of entry, we'd be faced with the same situation. So why not allow Hours, everyone to come in at the ports days, of entry? Because that way we can control what is in our custody. Remember, we gotta have people. So you gotta bring in 200 people. Where are you gonna put them? Where? But they're crossing anywhere. Where? Do you see but, what I'm saying? That's what I don't understand. But you gotta, if you can control your capacity, I would. If I can control, control my capacity here, I would too. I got no way of controlling it. ¿Qué andan jugando, niños? Andale. Shelters in Mexico, like this one, run by Pastor Juan Fierro, are crowded with asylum seekers torn between crossing illegally and waiting their turn. Every time the U.S. makes the process more chaotic and uncertain, it pushes more of them to jump the line. El mensaje es que tales peticiones deben presentarse en garitas oficiales y no en ningún otro lugar. En los Estados Unidos continúa siendo un crimen entrar de forma irregular. Mire, este video se nos dio para que nosotros lo diéramos a conocer a los centroamericanos. Ya todos estaban muy convencidos y todo, ¿verdad? Eh, empiezan ellos a ver la noticia de que Trump dijo que iba a cerrar las fronteras y llegaron a preguntarme, oiga, pastor, es que si cierran la frontera nosotros ya no tiene razón que estemos esperando el número. Y se fueron a cruzar. Y se fueron. Pero a cruzar. Yo creo que sí a cruzar ilegalmente. Y yo considero que eh, esto es el inicio. Porque es lo que le digo, esto se, se puede hacer como una presa y se puede desbordar, ¿sí? The threats to close the border and the metering policy at ports of entry are part of a strategy by the Trump administration to deter asylum seekers altogether. In its latest move, known as the Migrant Protection Protocol, the Trump administration has sent about 5,000 people back to Mexico to wait out their asylum cases, which can take months or years. That includes Caterin Molina, who fled Honduras with her family after she went to the police there to report death threats from a gang. El que está ahí para poner la denuncia, el de la policía, me dice que yo no sabía con quién me estaba metiendo. Porque somos, me dijo, un grupo muy grande. Somos. Somos. Y ustedes lo que van a hacer es aparecer muertos. Si quieren esas niñas que tienen, digo, váyanse del país. Molina waited 41 days to cross legally only to be turned back to Mexico to wait even more. The experience left her feeling that when the U.S. tells people like her to come the right way, what it really means is don't come at all. Pero la verdad que después de todo esto que ha pasado, yo me arrepiento de haber esperado el número. Yo si un familiar mío viene para acá, yo le diría, no, no lo esperes, no esperes el número. No vale Porque yo ya lo esperé mucho tiempo y no valió la pena. Fue algo en vano. Right, there's a group behind her with children. ¿Cuánto tiempo tienen viajando? Como unos 20 días. Como 20 días. ¿Por qué se vino de Guatemala? Yo sí, por amenazas. ¿Por amenazas? ¿Y usted, señora? El papá de él murió. Y por eso que venimos. Judging by the numbers on the border, the Trump administration's strategy of deterrence has failed. Republicans in Congress want to crack down harder. A Senate bill proposed today would effectively shut down the border to Central American asylum seekers and allow authorities to detain children for much longer. But many such proposals have died in Congress, and that has led Trump to consider going back to a more ruthless approach. The president has talked about how he wishes he could and wants to reinstitute zero tolerance in family separations. How would you feel about that? If that's what the government asked me to do tomorrow, then that's, that's what I do. My, I gotta set my feelings completely aside from my duties. 
I'm a Border Patrol agent 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I do what I am told to do. Break up Facebook. That's become a common refrain in recent months with advocacy groups, presidential candidates, and even one of the company's co-founders floating the idea. And on the surface, breaking up Facebook doesn't look that tough. Just force it to spin off Instagram and WhatsApp and maybe Messenger. The problem is that breaking up companies isn't something the government does often or easily. In the 1970s, it went after IBM. And in the 1990s, it tried to break up Microsoft. Both cases failed. In fact, there's only one successful breakup of a big company in the last 50 years, AT&T's back in the early 1980s, when it was just a phone company. At the time, AT&T had a virtual monopoly over all phone service in the US, but it still took 10 years between the filing of the lawsuit and the company's eventual breakup. So given how hard it would be to pull off a breakup and how long it would take, Facebook's sharpest critics are looking to other ways of limiting its power. Enter Josh Hawley, a first-term Republican senator from Missouri. At 39, he actually seems to get what's going on with the tech industry, and he's made policing it his pet cause. On Monday, he sent Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg a long, blistering letter attacking the way the company handles user data and demanding to know what steps it's taking to actually protect user privacy. I talked to him today about his crusade to rein in Facebook. You sent a letter on Monday to Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, and it was about the company's pivot to privacy. Didn't seem like you were buying it in that letter. I'd like for Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook to actually show me some evidence that they're really serious about this so-called privacy pivot. Because what we really see, I think, is Facebook trying to position itself to continue to grow its business, which is based on taking data from consumers without their consent, monetizing it without their permission, and then getting them addicted to their platform so they can have plenty of audience to sell their ads. And so far, all Facebook does is stonewall requests for information, stonewall requests uh, to actually come clean about their business practices. Do you want to see Facebook broken up? Yeah, I think that's something that should be on the table. I mean, I think it's time for the FTC to get tough with Facebook. Would we be better if we had 50 or 100 Facebooks all violating consumers' privacy? I'm not sure. What we need to do is stop their privacy violations, stop them take advantage of consumers, and we need to have a discussion about this addiction business model. It's rumored that there will be a $5 billion fine implemented on Facebook. You have said that that is not enough. How much is enough in your eyes? Maybe Mark Zuckerberg ought to be named. I mean, if Mark Zuckerberg knowingly approved, and the reporting suggests he did, of this practice of giving consumers information to third-party developers, which the 2011 consent decree is supposed to prevent, then Mark Zuckerberg ought to be on the line personally. It's not necessarily being on the hook monetarily, okay. personally, for all of the fines. Um, although, under existing law, there is some potential, I think, for, uh, for some monetary penalties. But it, it is being named as someone who is directly responsible. Your campaign spent $30,000 on Facebook yeah. ads yeah. throughout the last year, from May of 2018 to May of 2019. Was that low? Yeah. Are you using some of the targeted data that you are criticizing Facebook for using in your own political campaign? Well, we certainly we certainly advertise on Facebook. Now, in terms of the data that we use, I don't know that we're privy to any special data, but uh, certainly I think that's not available to any other user of the Facebook application. Look, Facebook has created, has, 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 this is part of what being a monopoly is, is that they control this space, and this is why we need to have this discussion. I mean, they control this particular public sphere. This is why we need more people in the market. This is why we need more competition. And this is why we need to be talking about their control over information flows. When it comes to Facebook specifically, do you have regulatory ideas in mind right now? Some of the bills that I proposed would apply to Facebook in terms of keeping kids safe, their online tracking, online advertising, the right of giving back information, uh, all of the data that they've collected from children. I think we do need to talk about political bias. I think we do need to talk about the privacy rights, not just of children, but of adults too, online. Will you preview any of that right now? 
<laughs> I don't think I have anything beyond that to, to offer for you other than to say that uh, more is coming. Watch this space. A year ago, President Trump moved the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, a decision that was met with international condemnation. But the condemnation didn't actually do anything. And since then, Trump has gone even further. He recognized Israel's sovereignty of the occupied Golan Heights, cut funding for Palestinian aid, and last month, backed Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's successful right-wing campaign for re-election. The renewed closeness between Israel and the US has only infuriated Palestinians more. Their leadership has cut off all official contact with the Trump administration, meaning peace talks are essentially stalled. I think it's one of the most important decisions made by President Trump and all American presidents. If anything, it will institutionalize, stabilize the city and the region. You think it's been a good year then? One of the best years Jerusalem ever had. Palestinians are not gonna agree with you, are they? Since last March, for example, there have been over 275 demonstrators that have been killed, 17,000 who've been injured. The relationship between the Palestinian leadership and the Israeli government has deteriorated. Gaza is still under siege. That's not a great year for Palestinians, is it? Well, first of all, the city of Jerusalem has never been so quiet. And the reality is that if you look at the Palestinians living in Gaza, they have serious problems on their own. And the more they fight Israel, the worse off they are. So there's a very clear rule in the Middle East. If you cooperate with the city of Jerusalem, with the state of Israel, you do far, far better. So what you're saying it's is very clear message. it's our way or the highway, is what you're saying. I'm saying that uh, Israel and Jerusalem was never anything but the Jewish state. So you don't think the Palestinians should ever be allowed to have a state? I don't think so, no. Statehood doesn't seem to be part of Jared Kushner's plan either. Trump's son-in-law and advisor says he'll finally release his so-called peace plan next month. Only nobody outside of America and Israel thinks it's workable. On December 6th, President Trump was very clear that his decision and today's celebration do not reflect a departure from our strong commitment to lasting peace. Details have been kept under wraps, but leaks suggest the deal focuses on Israeli security. Have you discussed Things with Kushner aligned. anything? We've told them what I think we should do, uh, but they have not yet told us what they think. The reports suggest that this plan doesn't lay out Palestinian statehood at all. What it does is it offers them some financial incentives uh, in return for giving up statehood. Is that in any way realistic, or does it just show how naive uh, the Trump administration is when it comes to the Middle East? Well, I think the world is naive, not the Trump administration. I think the Trump administration has been looking at the reality on the ground and not being moved by international politics. How are you expecting yeah. Palestinians to come to the table and accept any form of agreement when they're being completely excluded from the negotiating table? They have to rethink their, their strategy and tactics and what they want with the State of Israel. Is as freedom, long as they... sovereignty too much for a people to ask for? They're, they can have their autonomy and uh, civil autonomy, which is in many, many ways uh, very close to sovereignty. Unfortunately, uh, the country cannot be split to two. The Palestinian Prime Minister has already said this, this deal is not on the table. We're not even going to consider it. They have to rethink their direction. We will continue our path uh, with a very clear mission uh, in the Jewish state, in the land of Israel. We will know also how to fight uh, our enemies that try to throw us to the sea and challenge us security-wise. We will know how to fight and defend ourselves. The Palestinians don't have any cards left to play. Their prime minister says that any proposal from the Trump administration might as well be, quote, born dead. But it doesn't matter. With this kind of robust American support, Israel is emboldened to do as it pleases. Shudu is a model whose career took off sometime last year thanks to her massive following on Instagram. She shot campaigns for Aless and French luxury house Balmain. Also, Shudu isn't human. Former fashion photographer and Shudu creator Cameron James Wilson 
refers to her as the world's first digital supermodel. He runs his modeling agency, The Digitals, from his apartment in Weymouth, an English harbor town. So how does it work? Let's just say I'm a client, right? Mm -hmm. What do I do? Where do I go from there? I pick a model? No, you would email me, okay. talk about your project, um, probably ask what models are available because that's what most clients do. Even if they're digital, presumably they're always available. It depends on the project because I like, I'm very kind of picky when it comes to partnering who with who. In the same way that a model might say, Gucci isn't for me, but Chanel totally. You're the same with the digitals? Yeah, I'm definitely kind of trying to build a character with them. And you can't do that by just letting any client pick what, do you know what I mean? It just doesn't yeah. work. Right now I've just loaded in Shudu's file. Mm -hmm. This is kind of where I start, just a very, very kind of blank expression, T-pose. Over the years, I've kind of like added a lot more skin texture to the point where now I have to like Photoshop it a little bit to give it that kind of Photoshop look. Um, that great Photoshop look. That Photoshop look. What was your inspiration for Shudu? Growing up, I really, really loved like the kind of 90s supermodel, like where this kind of depiction of women was almost like a superhero in a way. You don't think that part of the attraction is that the clients don't have to deal with an actual person. They still have to deal with a person at the end of the day. I'm, I'm on the other end of the line. I do see the appeal though, that, that people understand how that character is gonna be portrayed. You're not gonna see them falling out of a car, or drunk or anything like that, which is a positive, but as I mentioned earlier, also a negative, because people like that kind of thing. Do you feel a connection with Shudu more so than with the other models? Yeah, absolutely. She was the first model that I created. She pulled me out of a situation where I was feeling horribly depressed and really kind of, in a way, changed my life. I mean, how can I not be grateful to, to her? And she's not even real. The fact that Cameron, a white man, created the image of a highly Africanized black woman and profits from its notoriety hasn't gone unnoticed. What was your reaction the first time that you read a tweet or an article that suggested that you were racist? Um, my reaction was like, here we go. But you have to consider some of these points. I looked into it, didn't necessarily agree, but at least I explored that in myself. There's an element of being able to admire blackness mm -hmm. without ever having to deal, deal with a black woman, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? I think that's a horrible way to look at it, really. I don't think, I don't think that's the reasoning behind anything I've ever done. Um, if that was the case, then why would I use a motion capture actress that was a black woman? The problem with Shudu is she's very hyper real. She looks so realistic that you believe that she's a woman and you treat her as such, but she's not. People are booking a digital model and they're booking her because she's the world's first digital supermodel. If I had made a, a, a white model, if I had made an Asian model, they would want her just the same. Last month, Cameron contributed to the makeover of one of America's most famous white men, KFC's Colonel Sanders. But he isn't the only person creating virtual characters. Cameron declined to tell us how much he's made off of his models, but investments from Sequoia Capital, among others, value the company behind another virtual influencer, Lil Michaela, at $125 million. <laughs> oh, wait, I was so impressed. I was like, wait, wow. Digital models will go hand in hand with real models and real models are going to have digital replicas and things like that. I mean, you can live forever as a digital model. You, your appearance can be used for generations. If you imagine what will happen if Kim K gets a 3D double made, it's like, will, <laughs> will it ever end? Do you know what I mean? And that's the kind of, that's what's going to happen. You know, people will become heirlooms. They will become part of your, you know, you will inherit them.